How can we make music that evokes longing and desire, and mysticism? Music that sounds like you're flying towards the stars. In this video, we will explore the musical style of the complex and enigmatic Russian composer Alexander Skriabin, who was born on January 6, 1872. He studied piano and composition at the Moscow Conservatory, where he was classmates with Sergei Rachmaninoff. Throughout the 1890s, he toured as a pianist-composer, often premiering works of his such as his piano concerto and early piano sonatas. From the 1900s onwards, Skriabin's musical language started to break further away from traditional Western harmony. Simultaneously, Skriabin also began exploring more and more ideas related to theosophy, mysticism, and his own personal theories. Ready? Yeah, awesome. Is that clean enough? Yeah, I think we can handle that. We can it. We are, for instance, tomorrow going to do a sequence of Scriabin preludes. A man who writes basically in his mature years using one chord, his magic chord, again and again and again, until you think, enough, you know? And yet a man who wanted uh, perfume, color, all the, the, you know, the application of every, every sensual aspect applied to the perception of the music. He was indeed an eccentric character with desires to create utopia through his music, such as with his Mysterium a piece involving all different forms of art, also known as a Gesamtkunstwerk, which he intended to be performed in the Himalayas as a week-long event that would eventually be followed by both an apocalypse and a reformation of the world. Uh, his music is often dismissed in the West as something terribly eccentric and very strange. Um, even his late music, where it is idiomatic, totally idiomatic, one can easily characterize him as a megalomaniac and self-indulgent idealist, but a deeper look into his music reveals him as a hopeless romantic that was enveloped by his own ideas of universal redemption. One thing is for certain though, his music holds a significant place in music history. In the following sections, I'll first break down elements of Scriabin's musical style while analyzing a selection of Scriabin's piano works. Then, I'll reconstruct these notes as I create an arrangement of Happy Birthday in the style of Scriabin. To narrow down the focus of his ever-changing style, I've chosen to base my studies on the earlier half of his compositions. As a pianist, playing Scriabin is like using the entire keyboard and almost feeling like this is not enough because he just uses so much of these registers. So here we have a lot of sequences and it's all leaping upwards. We have it being played, let's say here, and then it gets repeated slightly higher and then higher, bigger, and tension is growing all the while. While Scriabin broke down traditional rules, he clung to the inherited form. This is the opening of Sonata Number no. 2, Opus 19. We start with the short phrase. Something similar. So two short phrases, now a long. So this sort of format is quite traditional. It's following the model of many of the earlier composers. Short, short, long. Change, change, change the attitude. It's like a bird which is flying, flying. Suddenly birds decide, <laughs> maybe there's a fish. No. So the way he switches moods very suddenly also reminds me of Schumann. So you have something delicate and all of a sudden you open up. becomes much more extroverted. And here, odd groupings, groups of five. And it invites this very fluid type of phrasing. A 
A lot of times when I'm listening to Scriabin, I think of molasses that evaporates all of a sudden because sometimes the music, even if it's not dense with many notes, it just feels very thick. And then all of a sudden it just evaporates and becomes extremely delicate, and really thin. Naive and um, and uh, very attractive in its naivety, yeah. of course. Um, beautifully composed and Chopinesque, of mm. course, but not entirely. The left hand, especially, is very Chopinesque. For example. Chopin's fourth ballade. Versus. So I was exaggerating here, but there is an inner line that comes in, which is very typical of Scriabin. It makes reading it super difficult. It's also worth noting that due to an injury in his youth, Scriabin dealt with chronic pain in his right arm and hand. This became worse during his conservatory years due to repetitive stress from practicing and prompted him to focus more on his left hand. Consequently, one can find exceptionally present and elaborate left hand parts in his piano compositions. Many people point out that the fourth sonata was a, a step, a borderline into harmonically into unknown regions and also spiritually again. All of these beautiful slides. And very smooth voice leading. For example, here, if you start from the A, B flat, B, And I think that's what makes it sound so smooth and beautiful. There are three important states in states of mind or states of spirit, as he said in his music. Um, the one, one of them is longing, uh, the next one is uh, the flight of the free will of free spirit and the last one is the ecstasy. So you hear all of these pairs of notes or even at the beginning. These are like trochees. You hear this a lot in rap these days. A trochee is a foot that has a stressed syllable followed by a weak syllable. So for example, teenage, mutant, ninja, turtles. The stressed syllable in this case falls on what we might consider the musical downbeat. So something like this, this is his more tumultuous side. Sounds like there are multiple layers, but it's really just. So 
very clever. I really like that, appreciate it as a pianist. And it's challenging. Because you just have to make it sound like one wave. And it's like that with a lot of Scrabble's music. I feel like in order to hear what he's going for, you have to have a certain amount of distance from it. Almost like looking at a picture. If you're too close, maybe you're paying attention to the pixels. It doesn't make as much sense, but you really have to just step back and then, then you see it in a different way. Something like this, this may be a bit of a stretch, but if I imagine a swing rhythm to be added, I feel like a lot of these chords, a lot of these lines would make a lot of sense. I think that's why a lot of jazz musicians love Scriabin. If you analyze a lot of his music as chord changes with a lot of extensions added, it's quite appropriate to be translated into the jazz idiom. quite ambiguous because you don't know where you're going. So it's kind of unsettling, but at the same time, it's, it, it puts you in this dreamy world. I want to talk a bit about the mystic chord. Of course, <laughs> this is the famous chord. You can look at it in many different ways. It's been analyzed to death. <laughs> And seriously, if you go down that rabbit hole, you can find so much information about it. For me personally, it helps me more to look at it in a much simpler way. I look at it as a dominant seventh chord with a whole tone scale infused together. Dominant seventh chord and a whole tone scale. More specifically, the way that I personally view and understand the formation of this chord is quite simple. Again, starting with a dominant seventh chord, I'm going to voice it like so. So this is a C7, C dominant seventh chord. I'm going to keep certain pitches in place and I'm going to take some pitches and push them upwards by a whole step. I'm going to take this E here, the G here, and the C here, and just push them up a whole step. And now, we have the mystic chord. What's unique about Scriabin is that he'll use this not as just a fancy seventh chord, but he'll play with this suspended quality and he'll take it sort of anywhere he, he wants almost. Opus 57 number one, the opening here. Once the B is resolved by half step, we have the bottom four notes of the mystic chord. With that in mind, you can perhaps look at this first chord as some form of a C7. All right, I think that's an appropriate place to stop in terms of analyzing some of his scores. Really, this can be so endless, but I'm going to focus on the transition between his early period to his middle period because I'm going to write an arrangement of Happy Birthday in the style of Scriabin, and I just need to cap it somewhere. I've been reading a lot about Scriabin's life, some of his poems. I've been trying to understand more of maybe the reasoning why he was writing this material, what he was going for, because there's a lot of material on this matter. He really put an emphasis on what he's trying to achieve with his art, with his music. This Kevin died in 15, you know. I played for him one year before he died. In 1914, I played for him. So I came here, he was sitting like that. This guy, he was crazy, you know. And one day I played, it takes 10 minutes on it. This cabin told my mother, I told you that, that he will be a pianist and very well, but you have to educate him. He should know the literature, the painting, the, 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 the everything outside of the whole music, to opera, orchestra, everything. That is the secret, that you have to have acquaintance with the world. And the, the world is sinking now. 
It's not so good. It's also important to note that Scriabin had synesthesia, which made him perceive certain sounds as colors. This significantly influenced the way he wrote music. His symphonic poem Prometheus. There is a line in the score devoted to the color or colors he wanted projected during his performance. Like Kandinsky, the Russian painter, his exact contemporary and himself a theosophist, he held views on the spiritual role of art and on the role of the artist in the whole scheme of the universe. Scriabin believed he was someone very special, someone through whom ideas could be expressed so as to influence all mankind. To be honest, a lot of this goes over my head. It's really hard to follow. It's really hard to relate to sometimes as well. But I found that reading about this and focusing on this aspect of his music making was actually helping me come up with certain ideas for these arrangements. I've already written most of it. I'm just refining certain details at this point. And I'll just go over what I included and why. This is the intro. I wanted something ambiguous, something not quite settled yet, but very delicate, very hopeful, and wistful. So now here, the happy birthday theme. The difficult thing about this theme is that so much of the harmony and the rhythm is baked into the theme when it's recognizable. So as soon as you try to change it, it either sounds nothing like happy birthday or it's, it's just, it sounds like nothing like the composers. I'm using a stacked fourth chord and I'm voice leading in a similar way to Scriabin where we have common tones and then we're sliding downwards or upwards. So instead of just playing these chords, I'm opening these up the left hand thumb. Scriabin loves these fourths and tritones, so I feel like that's appropriate. Note that a lot of these left hand figures are going top to bottom. So if we were to play bottom to top, it feels more grounded. Just same notes with the direction reversed. really different. Here I want to end the phrase with an F sharp major chord and if I do something like this, very straightforward, one, two, three, one, two, three. On the grid, it, it doesn't feel right for this type of style in, in Scriabin's world, so I'm going to place the notes in a much more fluid manner. There we go, something like that. A little Chopin-esque line here. Here I'm just abandoning that little fragment. It's there, but a little shift. A quote of Opus 32 number one. And I repeat it twice. And that end here, flat sixth rub. So you, you don't even feel like anything's ever resolved. I decided to start a second prelude. So here I started to write this as the leading motive. Tritones, also this trochee. Da-da, da-da. I feel like these ba 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 chords just adds a little bit of nervous energy here. A frantic leap upwards here. And 
here I, I want to do something with the left hand where I'm something like that. Something <laughs> you always have this sort of noble yet bold, daring, raw, raw <laughs> type of energy. Probably something wider like that. Unnecessarily difficult. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Flailing upwards. And here I was thinking of, of trill. This is the general idea and I'm going to work on it. Again, refine some details and then take it to the piano. Now here is Happy Birthday in the style of Scriabin presented in the form of two short preludes. Thank you all for watching and subscribing, and a special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon for helping me make videos like this one.